tonight I'd like to present the American oh. <laughs> oh, no. the women's writer writers of Denmark. Well, you can and, say American. We have nothing to um, I'm yeah. glad to present Colleen. Thank you. Yes. Copenhagen collection and I've written about 55 60 poems about the city and in and out of the city and up in the countryside we have a, a summer house up there so and I decided to write about spring I've chosen those poems okay so the first one is called electric green electric Whitman green the sing, the reason to believe, to move outside. The air nowhere is very cold. What? We were used to it. Didn't notice the layers we had to put on. But we were so longing for flowers. And now that they are here, in red, pink, and scattered yellow, they place us temporally. Clusters of clouds move slowly above us, not wanting to end the moment either. This daydream of the reversal of seasons. Okay, I only have, you know, you only have to put up with seven, so don't worry. They're pretty short. This one's called Rarity because for me, spring, even though it comes every year, it's, it's rare. You know, I'm just like desperate to see it and I'm so happy to to be out in it again and today when we were riding our bikes in here we could see the leaves just starting to come out I just get so excited okay rarity outside the morning is in full throes bicyclers are freer now women's dresses flowing men in shorts a couple move into the botanical gardens taking up a whole bench admiring the released turtles from a safe distance, drinking beer, kissing in between bites of bread they retrieve from an over-dimensional picnic basket, <laughs> not close to the ants on the ground, scurrying, weeping maybe for crumbs, as crows, pigeons, ducks crowd around the garbage cans, their weight is interminable. Impatience is not this season, but the one just left. <laughs> the next one is called Trills for the Birds. A cacophony of trills, some real show offs, but hidden in the bushes. They turn on their bird heel claws one by one, then suddenly together, interrupting each other, like sellers hawking their wares on the opposite side of the square. <laughs> this, is a, this is called the main thing, and the reason it's the main thing, sometimes the main thing is a tiny little thing, sometimes it's not a big thing, even though it's the main thing. So, try to see. The feathered ended reeds hide a blockbuster of a bird show. Flitting fast, place to place, bees inspired too, moving constantly, never really lighting on any one pedal, but momentarily. Then with hind legs collecting that color that would, in a painting, be the main thing. Someone's keeping an eye on the door. You know, I wish they'd do that in my class. <laughs> People coming in and out all the time. Okay, this one's called Dotted. 
Dotted stripes across the sliding glass door. Drama in the skies. Rain first turns to hail, pelting the newly planted daisies, fuchsia, geraniums. White cat with her nose to the crack of air on its way in here. Thinks it's spring. Other evidence in street below. Danes without their jackets. Blackbirds perched just outside on a new leafy tree, singing steadily, stalwart cousins and survivors. This is a poem called Misunderstanding, because when people try to talk to animals, then sometimes we don't understand them, and maybe they don't understand us. So I'm trying to understand a seagull here, and it's not working very well. <laughs> Oh, right. this video is a little yeah. <laughs> this must be a misunderstanding, really. Glacially, those boulders pushed up along the shore line themselves up in curves. The seagull says something about it for a long time. Me needing an interpreter. <laughs> and my last one. It's called brazen, uh-huh. because, you know, spring is, right? Spring is brazen. I thought you were speaking about yourself. Well, that too. All right. <laughs> it's the twisted trunks of the oak trees that are so brazen. It's the red-berried bush that is waving temptation. It's the wind set in motion that white caps the ocean. It's the view down the forest path. It's the grassy middle it's the Gauguin painting in the glyptotech, minus the eerie figure. We supplant her with the both of us, watching the oaks bend over the path, reaching out to the beech trees, gone begging. Thank you. Thanks, Colleen. That's great. Um, our next performer will be Karen Steinhardt, who will be reading a short story called Room Service. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Well, I'll see what it feels like to stand here and see if I would rather sit down. This story is set in the uh, mid-1970s when people smoked on airplanes and used dial telephones, just so that I throw you off. Room service. They met waiting for a United flight from L.A. to San Francisco. She caught him staring at her in the boarding lounge. She pulled up the black mink collar of her coat, worn over Levi's, and pretended to read her book. When they boarded the plane, she sat by the window and waited for him to sit next to her. He lit a cigarette and said, why are you so defensive? Which made her smile and say, because I hate being picked up in airports. (coughs) He said, I can read you like a book and I know you hate being picked up in airports. He handed her his business card, Larry Sherman, Vice President, Fashion Incorporated. She said, is this you, Larry Sherman? No, he said, I carry other people's cards around and (laughs) hand them out. She met his eyes. When I do get picked up in airports, it's always by some pseudo-psychologist who thinks I'm defensive. His quick look assured her that he had felt the put-down. She had met him, too, but his vulnerability softened her so that when he asked if he could buy her a drink, she said yes. By the time they landed in San Francisco, they had decided to get a room, ignoring her husband who didn't care in Denver and his wife who didn't know in Los Angeles. (laughs) (laughs) He said, what are you, about a size nine? I'm going to send you one of the new battle jackets. They're in patchwork and cute as hell. She said, basically, I'm a pacifist. (laughs) (laughs) The glass elevator gave her vertigo. Room 352 was not as elegant as she thought a $200 room would be. 
He took her coat and rather gently slid his hand under her blouse. Her heart pounded. Tiny drops of perspiration began under her bangs. He pulled her to the bed and groped at the brass buckle on her belt. She excused herself to go to the bathroom, and when she returned, he'd undressed and was under the covers, talking on the telephone. <laughs> <laughs> he, he motioned for her to join him, and very slowly, very carefully, she took off her clothes and laid them on the bureau. She left on a pale pink bikini panty, which he pulled off impatiently. He said, most men go off in a few minutes and don't satisfy you, do they? <laughs> he began a rhythm above her. Most men don't have this kind of control, do they? <laughs> he didn't listen for an answer. Tell me how good I am in bed. <laughs> Say, you're great in bed, Larry, okay? <laughs> this time, he waited for her to respond, and she said, you're great in bed, Larry. <laughs> It took 45 minutes before she could convince him that she had really had enough. <laughs> he picked up the telephone and asked what movies he could see on television. The screen filled with Telly Savalas and Charles Bronson in an uncertain plot of betrayal and violence. An open sports car with a beautiful woman and Charles Bronson began a chase under the Parthenon in Athens. The car was cut off in a small square and fire opened from a sedan. <clears throat> Bronson rolled under the car and was wounded. The woman was not injured. Later, the woman went off with Telly Savalas and lived in a mansion next to a river. Charles Bronson took her rowing on the river, made love to her, and shot her in the head. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, Larry moved swiftly out of bed to the floor and started doing sit-ups. He stood up panting and said, I do that every day. Mm -hmm. I have a black belt in karate. She said, you feel safe when you walk down the street. He looked at her as if she had said something important. You know, that's true. I was in Vegas, and these guys made a remark to the woman I was with, so I told them to meet me outside. There were three of them, and I said, okay, which one of you sons of bitches wants to be first? The biggest one came over to me, and I caught him under the ear and knocked him cold. The other two got the hell out of there, and when the police came, I told them that the guy must have fainted. The police get uptight about you walking around as a karate expert. <laughs> he touched his toes almost violently and reached over on the return to pull her up off the bed. Stand there and pretend you're going to attack me. No, really, <laughs> pretend you're going to attack me. She made a move toward him, and he blocked her swiftly with one arm while the other came up to apply pressure to the sensitive place under her ear. He said, see? She had her arms crossed defensively over her breast, and he grabbed her, turning her and pinning her against him. He allowed her to fall back on the bed and said, I got a check with Tom in L.A. He's my assistant, and he's not too bad. He gave the credit card number to the operator and waited for Tom to come on the line. He said, me again. I'm not going to go out again today. I've got a cute little fox here with me at the hotel. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'd have to give her a 10. Hmm. She lives in Denver. Hey, that's right. I don't know. He turned to her and said, Tom has a ski vacation this winter. Can he call you in Denver? <laughs> she said, sure, I'm listed. He returned to Tom and said, did I get any calls? Oh, shit, I'll call her back. He hung up the phone and lit a cigarette. Listen, I have to call my wife. She's checking all the stores for me. Could you go in the bathroom or something? I can't talk to her with you here. She moved in a small private fog toward the bathroom and loudly closed the door and turned on the fan. The bathroom was beige, with beige fixtures. There was a pamphlet on the back of the toilet. She glanced at it and learned more than she wanted to know about the hotel chain. <laughs> <laughs> she sat on the closed toilet seat and stared at her toes. She opened the door and listened. Nothing. She peered into the room, and Larry said, God damn that woman. She said, and so what's with a little woman? He said, you can laugh. Your old man doesn't care, but my old lady's on my ass, and I have to be careful as hell. There have only been you and two others since I've been married, you know. You ought to be really flattered, as a matter of fact. <laughs> she said, I'm really flattered. <laughs> he crushed his cigarette rather brutally into the ashtray. She can't have any children, you know. I told you that. We had all the tests best doctors in L.A., it's her. <clears throat> so she has these horses. She's down at those damn stables most of the day. I suppose it's too much to ask for her to want to spend a little time with me after I'm gone all day. 
I told her she can ride all day, and if she wants to see her friends, she can do that during the day, too. But when I come, I want her there with me. She said, listen, you said you'd take me out to dinner. Are you hungry? He said, have you been to Skoma's yet? It's fantastic. It's down at the wharf, but it's really good, really good seafood. She said, I don't want to get dressed again. Why don't we eat in the room? He called room service and ordered steak, medium, and held the phone while he asked, steak, prawns, or lamb? She made a face and said, prawns. At least I won't have to cut them. My wife, she was a contestant for Miss World. I told you that. She still looks good. I give her everything she wants, a beautiful house, all the clothes she wants, and the horses. They really cost. If it weren't for the kids, she'd have everything. There was a knock on the door. He said, do you mind? It's just room service, but I feel better if you wait in the bathroom, you know? <laughs> <laughs> when she came back out, white linen and silver service had been set up on the round writing table next to the television set. There was hardly room for the food, which had come up in double-decker silver serving dishes. She put on her blouse and sat down at the table. She said, how's your steak? He talked with his mouth full. It's okay. Everything gets a little steamy when you order from room service. She said, I've never had food sent out before. He said, do you want more coffee? She shook her head. No, it's not really hot. He said, we can do it again after dinner. It will be even better. <laughs> <laughs> she dipped her last prawn into hot sauce and put the whole thing into her mouth. He went on. Have you ever done it with women? She said, once. He pushed his plate away. That's something I'd really like to do, watch you with another woman. There's this chick in one of the stores out in Fremont. She's only 18 and she was a virgin. She's crazy about me. If I called her, she'd come over here. He waited expectantly. She realized it was her cue. She said, do you think she'd be up for something like this? He pulled the telephone over and when it finally rang, asked for Eileen. Hi, you know who this is? Yeah, well, I'll be out to the store tomorrow, but now I'm in the city, in a hotel room. I thought you might want to come over. Fantastic. Hey, hang on a minute. He put his hand over the receiver and said, she's coming. I told you she was crazy about me. She said, don't you think it would be a good idea to tell her about me? He went back to the phone. Eileen, yeah, there's this one thing. There's someone with me. Yeah, yeah, another woman. Uh, oh, well, uh, what do you think it means? Uh, sure I do. He put his hand over the receiver again and said, she's crying, now what do I do? <laughs> he returned the receiver to its cradle and said, she hung up on me. The crazy bitch hung up on me. Doesn't she know I could get her fired for that? He walked over to the bed and found a smear of blood on the top sheet. He said, you're bleeding. He checked himself anxiously for stains and said, Do you ever feel like you just want to be alone? It's, it's nothing personal. She said, You are alone. He said, No, really, you've helped me tonight. I'm going to tell my wife she can spend all the goddamn time she wants with the horses. I think I could get into karate again, take a class at night, keep in shape. I'm really vain, you know. How old do you think I look? 45. He said, 47, 48 in November. <laughs> they dressed and went down to the lobby in separate elevators. She waited until the car was brought up from the underground garage and then said suddenly, I, I'm not going with you. I'll get, a, I'll get a cab. He said, no, I'll, no, I'll drop you off where you're going. She said, no, no, I, I know where I'm going. She watched him turn the rental car up Lombard, its display of backup lights grinning at her. She stepped across the continuous traffic of Market Street. A mass of people pushed past her with their eyes averted. An old woman wearing a black straw hat and a Christmas corsage veered toward her, stopping her to straighten her black mink collar and button her coat. The old woman said, you could catch cold like that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now we're going to change over a bit to something different. Um, I'd like to introduce Lena Lehman, who is going to sing for us. A cappella. Hello. I'm going to sing one of my songs for you. Øh, noget af det, jeg godt kan lide ved dem, det er, at, øh, at tekstforfatterne virkelig har leget med, med ordene. 
Og det er ikke helt sådan, alt efter hvor mange år siden. Det handler om kærlighed, og øh, det er sådan øh, spirende, forsmået, øh, glødende, længselsfuld kærlighed. The autumn leaves drift by the window. The falling leaves of red and gold. I see your lips, the summer kisses, the sunburned hands I used to hold. Since you went away, the days grew long, and soon I'll hear a winter song. But I miss you most of all, my darling, when autumn leaves start to fall, c'est une chanson. Qui nous ressemble, de toi qui m'aime et moi qui t'aime, nous vivons tout, les deux ensemble, toi qui m'aimais, moi qui t'aimais, mais la vie se parle, ceux qui s'aiment. Tout doucement s'en fait du bruit Et la mer efface sur le sable Les pas des amants désunis The falling leaves drift by the window The autumn leaves of red and gold I see your lips, the summer kisses, the sunburned hands I used to hold. Since you went away, the days grew long, and soon I'll hear a winter song. But I miss you most of all, my darling. When autumn leaves start to fall, when autumn leaves start to fall, when autumn leaves start to fall.
writing songs of love, but not for me. The lucky stars above, but not for me. With love to lead the way, I've had more clouds of grey than any Russian play could guarantee. I was a fool to fall and get this way. I all alas and all so like a day. I know I can't dismiss the memory of his kiss. I guess he's not for me. He's knocking on a door, but not for me. He'll plan a two by four, but not for me. I know that love's a game. I'm puzzled just the same. Was I the moth? Or flame, I'm all at sea. It all began so well, but what an end. This is a time a fellow needs a friend. When every happy plot ends with a marriage night, and there's no knot for me. No, there's no knot. For me, no, 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 not for 